Hi guys, my name is Shawnee and I'm the host of Lawless Scotland podcast, where I talk about all things true crime in Scotland. Join me on this journey into some of the darkest places in Scottish history, where we'll dive into serial killers, cults, murders and more. So put your feet up, relax, grab your glass of wine or cup of tea or whatever you're into and come join me at Lawless Scotland. What happens when you step onto a train but you never get off? You never get to your destination, you never turn up to the office or the social event you'd plan with friends. Nobody really expects any day to be their last, never mind a train journey to be the thing to seal the deal. But that's exactly what happened in this week's case. I'm Emma, the host of the True Crime Witch podcast, and this week we are looking at the puzzling case of Debbie Lindsley. Born Deborah Debbie Lindsley in 1962, Um, I did try and search for an exact date, however I was unable to find one, all articles just say 1962. She was known as Debbie to friends and family and was born to Arthur and Marguerite Lindsley in Bromley, which is 11 miles south of London. Information about sort of Debbie's personal life and childhood is very few and far between. What we do know is that she had moved from her home in Bromley to Edinburgh, Scotland. Here she had found a job as a hotel receptionist and was in the process of training to be a manager. She did miss her friends and family daily, but it seems she quickly adapted to life in Scotland. In March 1988, Debbie was back home in London once again, but only for a few days this time though. Her bosses had sent her on a training course in nearby Hertfordshire, and they also gave her a few days after the course to spend with her family as they lived pretty close by and, you know, she hadn't seen them for a while. Gordon Lindsley, who is Debbie's brother, was also due to get married in two weeks' time, so this trip was perfect for her. She was able to attend training to further her career, she could see her family, and she could also have her final bridesmaid dress fitting. Now we go to March 23rd, 1988, the day that everything changed for the Lindsley family. They had all gathered at their parents to have some lunch and say their goodbyes, It was more of a, you know, see you later affair. None of them anticipated the events that would unfold within the next two hours. Following lunch and a relaxing afternoon watching Neighbours, the Australian TV show, they weren't sat in their living room watching what the neighbours were up to, that would be weird. Gordon offered to give Debbie a lift to the train station. Now, although the family lived in Bromley, she was dropped off at the Pets Wood train station. This was because Gordon only worked around the corner, so he was, you know, might as well drop her there as he was going up that way anyway. Debbie's train was due to arrive into Petswood at 16 minutes past two, with the journey taking around 35 minutes to London, Victoria. Now, Debbie was never actually supposed to board that 16 minutes past two train, and a quote from her father, Arthur, reads, She was here three nights and was due to leave late in the afternoon to go back to Edinburgh for work, but... On the course, she met the manager of the Sherlock Holmes Hotel in London, and she left earlier to speak to him about a job. Sporting a very 80s perm-like hairstyle, Debbie made her way into Petswood Station. Now, police would later reconstruct this for the UK TV show Crime Watch, as these were some of her last confirmed movements. A model is seen wearing a blue skirt, white blouse, and a black leather jacket carrying a overnight weekender bag. Debbie entered the train station at about 10 minutes past two after being dropped off at the entrance at five past two. She made her way to the counter, bought a train ticket, a packet of cigarettes, and then stood on the platform waiting for a train to London, Victoria. The train journey should have taken around 35 minutes. I checked with National Rail. It appears the travel time is still the same in 2020, which is a shock, I know. Of course, this is London, so the train was delayed, and two minutes later, at 18 minutes past two, the train finally turns up at the train station, and Debbie gets on board. 
This was 1988, remember, in South East London, so the trains were pretty old. They were the old-fashioned carriages that had compartment rooms for six people. Think the trains from Harry Potter or an old war film. I do believe the carriages weren't joined together by a walkway, so once you were in, you were sort of in, which is why they were called the death traps. It's unknown if Debbie was alone when she boarded a train at 18 minutes past two in Petswood. We don't know if someone was already in the compartment or someone boarded into her compartment during the journey. Due to a lack of CCTV and eyewitness accounts, it's likely something that we'll not know until we obviously find who killed her. Debbie chose to sit near the front of the train, which in the 1980s was the designated smoking area. I'm not sure how many countries still allow smoking in public places, but it's only really in recent years that the UK banned smoking in pubs, restaurants, other public areas, much to many people's dismay, but whatever. Gazing out of the window, taking in the sights of home, Debbie smoked two cigarettes and had a bit of a sandwich that she brought for her journey. As the train left Brixton on its final leg of the journey, Debbie's killer struck. Before we continue with this week's episode, there's just a quick message from our sponsors. True Crime by Indie Drop-In is a podcast that features episodes from independent true crime creators. Each week, you will explore a different aspect of the true crime genre. You will hear episodes about serial killers, violence, conspiracy theories, celebrities, white collar, and much, much more. You will hear creators from all over the world, including an episode from myself. I have uploaded episode 26, The Death of Baby P. If you want more info, you can search for True Crime Indie Drop-In in your favourite app, or click the link in my show notes. Thank you. Obsessed with UFOs and extraterrestrials? Convinced there's a chupacabra in your backyard? Is your doppelganger ruining your life? Do you love all things haunting related? If you answered yes to any, or none of these, then these are the mostly sensical, slightly drunken ramblings for you? Question mark? I'm Emily. And I'm Joel. And we're the hosts of Drink Drunk Dead. Join us, our two cats, Emma and Otto, and our house ghost, every week as we have a few drinks and discuss all things paranormal. And, and raise, raise a, a toast, toast to, to our, our ghosts. ghosts. Eighteen-year-old French au pair Helene Jocelyn heard terrifying screams coming from Debbie's compartment. She told police, I had never heard such screams. They stopped for about five seconds and then started again. She called out as if for help. They were screams of fear and very, very loud. Frozen in fear, Helene could do nothing more than sit and listen. She was later heavily chastised at Debbie's inquest by the coroner for failing to act and pull the alarm cord. On modern trains, these alarm systems enable the user to speak directly to the train driver who can in turn call the British Transport Police or intervene in the situation. As the train continued on its journey through Brixton into London, it passed a large number of houses and as we will come to see later, no one in these houses saw a single thing. The 16 minutes past two train from Petswood pulled into platform two at London Victoria at around 10 to three. Employees at the train station allow passengers to alight before doing a final sweep of the train, mostly making sure that you know no one had fallen asleep or just was trying to jib the train without paying for the fare. Once a full sweep had been conducted, the train would be allowed to let passengers on for a return journey. On that fateful March afternoon, Ron Lacey was on duty and he was sent to clear the trains. At 10 to 3, he found the body of Debbie Lindsley lying on the floor, covered in blood. Ron told the Sun newspaper, quote, I opened the door and saw her bag first, then her lying with her face towards the door. It was so shocking. The whole carriage was just covered in blood and police think that whilst most of this belonged to Debbie, some of it actually belonged to her attacker and she had put up one hell of a fight. Now, some sources say that she'd been stabbed five times, some say eleven. What we do know is that she'd been stabbed in the face, neck and the heart. The fatal injury had been the one to her heart. 
there were no mentions of sexual assault, but the au pair did say that she believed that someone was being assaulted and not stabbed. The attack is most likely to have taken place within the six minute window between Brixton and Victoria. If Debbie's attacker had been in her carriage the whole journey, what made him strike at this exact moment? The au pair did remain diligent and noticed an overweight man between the ages of 40 and 50 with like long ginger hair and a moustache limping away from Debbie's carriage. Because of the sheer size and magnitude of London Victoria, Helene soon lost him in the sea of people waiting to catch their next train or get to work. I do also men- want to mention that another man was seen getting to an open compartment near the front of the train where Debbie was sat. He was described to be stocky, around 30 years old, with blonde hair and he was wearing a pale jacket. An article written by the Sun newspaper states that in 1988 more than 250,000 people passed through London Victoria each day. So it's no wonder that the au pair lost sighting of the man limping, because that's a lot of people. Pair this with a lack of CCTV and Debbie's case just becomes all the more confusing. At 8pm, almost six hours after Debbie had been brutally murdered, Arthur and Marguerite's world was turned upside down. They were spending the evening with friends, having dinner, when they received a knock at the door. A knock at the door that no parent ever wants to get. Arthur told the Bromley Times, quote, It was about 8pm when the doorbell rang. There were policemen on the doorstep who wanted to speak to me. I was in shock. It's just not the sort of thing you expect to happen. Then all hell broke loose, end quote. Debbie's family were left heartbroken and very confused. They had just seen her hours earlier when they had said their goodbyes and she had boarded the train. She was due to be a bridesmaid for her brother Gordon in two weeks. Her career was really starting to take off and then there was the possibility that she might even land a job in London. So who would commit such a brutal act and and why? Why Debbie? There is a light, so to speak, at the end of the tunnel. Remember how I mentioned earlier about some of the blood not belonging to Debbie? Well, we do have a DNA profile of her killer. But sadly, so far, it's not been matched to anyone in, you know, any of the six million people in the police databases. So I think it's going to take a lot more work and it's going to take the right person to come forward with information that will lead to you know, more searches and more questions being asked. In 1999, the Metropolitan Police put together a task force named Murder Review Group, which paired up eight sets of their most experienced officers and set them the task of investigating some of the UK's coldest cases, and Debbie's was very high on that list. Keith Chamberlain, who was one of the assigned officers to the task force before his retirement, told The Guardian in 2003, quote, When we review a cold case, we're not looking for fault with the way that the first investigation was conducted. We're looking for missed opportunities, and in the main, that means we're looking for forensics. End quote. Bingo, ding, 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 we have a winner, we are looking for forensics. 70 passengers were on that 16 minutes past two or 18 minutes past two train to London, Victoria, and only one of them heard a single thing. 55 of these passengers have been interviewed and ruled out, but that still leaves us with 15 people who were unaccounted for. Debbie's family believe that a stranger is responsible for this callous crime, but police aren't so sure. The stabbing seemed incredibly personal and like someone was very, very angry with her. If it had been a stranger, then this is definitely not his first rodeo. It's too calculated and complex for a first-time killer to get away with. It makes me wonder if he was a regular user of the Petswood line to Victoria or wherever it originates and ends up. Until they are caught, we may never know, but it is very calculated that the killer knew he had a six minute window between Brixton and London Victoria to strike, most likely uninterrupted, and that was the longest stretch of the journey. And he knew that that was the final part of the journey, so he could, you know, escape, get off the train at London, Victoria, do a runner, and then they would be left to find Debbie's body. You know, he didn't kill her halfway, midway between 
the station, so that's very calculated of him. Since Debbie's death in 1988, police have desperately tried to solve her case. And this is a case that I would love to be able to bring you an update about in a month's time. Marguerite Lindsley passed away in 2011 following a stroke, not knowing who killed her daughter. She told The Guardian, quote, It didn't strike me until after six months that they probably wouldn't get anyone. My opinion is that if you can't bring her back, then there's no point. End quote. Arthur is now left with the prospect that his daughter's killer is also dead, something that has been extremely hard and painful to him to come to terms with. Her brother Gordon is now doing well for himself. He remarried and had two children of his own. Even through his brightest moments though, he always says to his dad, I wish Debbie was here for this, or I wish Debbie could see this. There is a £20,000 reward for any information that leads to the arrest or conviction of Debbie's killer, and I promise that I won't give up on this case. Much like Debbie's family and the investigators who have dedicated years to this. I did try to reach out to different journalists who've you know, written different articles over the years. I've tried to find Debbie's family to get some more information, but I wasn't able to find any contact details, so... If any of the Lindsay family are listening, I hope I did her case justice and I hope we're able to bring her justice because this case is horrific and there's nothing more that Debbie deserves than to know justice. If you have any information who, about who killed Debbie Lindsley, you are urged to contact Susan Stanfield of the Met Special Casework Investigation Team on 020-7230. 4294 or you can remain anonymous and contact Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 one. Thank you for giving Debbie's case a moment of your time today. It really means a lot. I really hope that in a couple of months time I can bring you an update and we have some movement in this case but from the day that it happened it has been cold and it has sort of sat cold ever since then. As always, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever social media, just search for True Crime Witch or True Crime Witch Podcast, I will appear. If you want to support my Patreon, you can do it for just a dollar a month, you'll get early access to episodes, and I'll send you a sticker and, you know, something cool. So remember friends, stay safe and stay spooky. Bye.